the advice I like to give to young composers is to tell them how I became interested in music for films and television. The way I started was when I was a child in Argentina, in school, the teacher wasn't there, I was, had nothing to do, waiting for the teacher or, or, you know. I would take a piece of white paper and I take, they were color pencils. I would take, for instance, orange color and I made a, a trash and I look at it and I, this is absolutely true, Dif difficult to believe, but this is how I started try to think what is the sound of this color. This is the first step when you're talking about audiovisual counterpoint. This I did it by instinct. You know, children, when they do things or they try to entertain themselves, this was a, my, kind, my kind of entertainment. Okay, the sound of this color orange is two oboes in minor second, A and B flat together, unison with a harpsichord. And that was for me the color orange. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was not studying music in that school. You know, the, all the school that you have to go. I was studying music on the other side because of my father. I was studying piano. My father, besides playing in the orchestra, big orchestra, concert master, he was also the director of a chamber orchestra. And the pianist there in that chamber orchestra was Enrique Barenboim, the father of Daniel. He was my first piano teacher. My father took me to concerts, to rehearsals. I saw Toscanini, I was sitting here. Toscanini was in the podium right here in the rehearsals. And I looked at conducting. It was amazing. I had the best musical education I wish everybody could have. Then, later on, I started to go to galleries or museums, and I started to look at paintings. And I said, what is the sound of this painting? And what is the story about? And because my father was taking me to opera, I started to, in my mind, create stories. You see, for instance, a man and a woman in a painting, and you start creating a love story. Maybe it's not, it doesn't, it's not in the painting. But you create a love story, and you tell the story through music, which is what happens with movie and television music. Mm -hmm. Then he was taking me to opera. Opera is very important to everybody here. Because in the 19th century, people were going to operas because there were no movies. And the opera has the same thing. They are telling a story, there's a screenplay, which is the libretto. Instead of talking, they are singing, but they are saying the same conflicts. It could be love, it could be hate, jealousy, all the things that you have in movies or television. And I started to see opera, this is very, very important. Because in movies, when there's a character talking, declaring, for instance, love, then you play the music soft. And Gert Berti did the same thing. And the, the same thing in movies. The, the thing I wanted to say, three things. Color orange, paintings, and opera. All right. I'll give you an example how I apply that, what I call audiovisual counterpoint. This is very important, too. For instance, in a cartoon, where the mouse goes and the xylophone, that's parallel motion. Mm -hmm. But for instance, if you have a very tragic scene, a very tragic scene, but there is a television set in that scene playing a cartoon, that's contrary motion. Because what you're hearing and what you're feeling is the tragedy or the drama. At the same time, there's something innocent, funny, but contrary motion. I apply that too. Sometimes I would tell the director, who wants all the way to the end, the tragic, make it more and more tragic. I said, no, you don't need that. 
oh, that's a good idea. And they realized that it's a good idea. Not all the time I was right, because I'm not a director, and I don't pretend to be, but it's a suggestion I give from the point of artistic. Maybe I'm wrong, but all the time I was right. Well, that is my problem, mm. because for me there's no difference between composition and orchestration. I would recommend not only to you, but to, to the students, a treatise of orchestration by Charles Kirchlin. He was also at the Paris Conservatory. His name is, sounds German, but it's Alze he was Alsatian, and he was amazing. Treatise of orchestration is my Bible. Mm -hmm. I consulted all the time, and I would recommend all those to train themselves to think already in the timber has to be. Mm -hmm. My first composition teacher in Buenos Aires, his name was Juan Carlos Paz. And he told me, when you write music, write, write away from the piano and write from a keyboard. This is the way all the composers, I don't want to compare myself, but from Mozart, Beethoven, they didn't, they didn't have to, because their training was written already Right mm -hmm. directly in score paper. And that, that, because of that, they said I was very prolific. <laughs> I mm -hmm. was prolific because I could do it. By doing like that, I didn't have to wait for an orchestrator. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You were doing it yourself. And this is all. Immediately. Yeah. Orchestration is, far, is part of composition. Mm -hmm. It's like, for instance, a painter. It's like doing a sketch of a paint, black and white or painting directly with colors. I don't think that Leonardo had to think first in sketches. Mm -hmm. He did it directly. Yes. Or Manet, the French impression. How? How is he going to do sketches of what? Yes. Or Stravinsky. He didn't write sketches. He, he heard everything together. So the Ravel, Debussy. Mm. The painter sees, and then he paints what he sees. The same thing, the music you hear, and you write what you hear. Same thing, audiovisual counterpart. Are you also teaching? No, I have no time. Besides, I don't have the methodology how to teach. Mm. In France, in Paris, there is a the conservatory where they teach you music, and the l'école normale de musique, which is where they teach you how to teach. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I didn't go to l'école normale. When I go to bed, I have next to my pillow music paper because ideas come to me and I'm afraid to forget them. So that's the story of my life because I don't sleep too much. Because I always write and write, so it's like a dream. Well, if I have to say something, I have to say it. It gets mm -hmm. inside me and cannot get out. And yes. it gets me very, very neurotic. <laughs> Well, music is a form of expression. It's a combination of what your heart and your brain at the same time have to say to the world. That's for me music. You can say to the world also from the heart and from the brain many things. You can say words, paintings, you can say anything. This is with sounds, any kind of sounds. Could be electronic, acoustic, any kind. The more important Silence. And this is for young composers, they have to listen to silence. And I listen to silence, very intense. Because when you listen to silence, all of a sudden things start to happen. And also silence, for instance, let's say you go to a concert hall, or anywhere, a, a, a rock and roll place, or jazz, anything, tango, or the mu folk music of Greece, or Turkey, anywhere. Before the musicians start playing, they silence. Then the music starts. And when they finish, again silence. So silence is very important. Because without silence, there will be no beginning, no ending of music.
Manteca. Uh-huh. It could be African. second part that was the bridge what you call in French Le Pont mm-hmm. see that mm-hmm. it's amazing why did you say it was Dizzy Gillespie for you? Well, he was a teacher also. People think that he played too many notes. Like they say to Mozart, you write too many notes, <laughs> Amadeus. He said, I got the notes I need. Dizzy played the notes he needed. Have you ever heard a record of his? You could analyze, play at upper speed, and you're going to see that every note belongs to a chord. Hmm. As a matter of fact, we did a concert in Chicago with a symphony orchestra. I did the, the orchestration of some of his music, and I did the chords that he wrote. And all of a sudden, there were jazz musicians who improvised, and he said, wait a second, why are you playing uh, C natural when the chord is C7 with it augmented 9th and 11th? And that was fine. He had a ear like bullets. He said, why are you playing that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, maestro. You know? That's the way he was. So you had many teachers, but one master. <laughs> yeah. This is Exactly. Exactly. That's very important. Well, I want to show you that in my music formation, it was jazz with Dizzy, but also classical. Mm-hmm. When I told you about Messiaen, who was the director of the music conservatory in Paris, mm-hmm. the top director, and he was a teacher of composition. This was vertical, I told you. My son was horizontal. He talked about the scales of limited transposition. Why? Mm-hmm. Because, for instance, you can play that's C major, mm-hmm. and then you can transpose it. So no, it can be transposed mm-hmm. 11 times. Mm-hmm. But there are scales that you cannot transpose. Like, for instance, the scale of the VC. Why? Because you start here. Yeah. But now you transpose here. You join the same scale. limited transposition. Uh-huh. So he had many, and one of them was and that's why I wrote the second theme of Mission Impossible. That's why I learned from the conservatory music and from this busy and messiah, classical and jazz. Stravinsky is another problem, the problem of rhythm. And jazz also has. Stravinsky doesn't think of melody or harmony, but he thinks in terms of cyclic rhythmic cells. The right of string. It's, it's like this. They are rhythmic cells because he does what we do in contrapoint, he does it with rhythms. He does retrogradation. He can be in 2 4, but the rhythms are not 2 4. So that's why he's an influence. I mean, I liked him even before I analyzed it. Mm-hmm.
but I like them very much. Turkish and Greek music also, because the rhythms of the folk Turkish and mm. Greek music are so incredible. Irregular. Uh, regular. Nine eights. Nine eights, or, or sometimes four four with added eight note. Mm. So it's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can add a dot to each one, and it's another thing. And that's what happens with these folk musics. And that's why I wrote Mission Impossible, because it was based on a rhythm from the, the Pyrenees called Tortico, which is 5-4. And that's why I did Mission Impossible. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. Once I was doing concerts in Europe, there, there was a press conference. And they asked me, why did you write Mission Impossible with five, four? And I said, I didn't know what, how, what are you going to say to that? <laughs> so I, I improvise because I'm a jazz musician, I improvise immediately. I said, I wrote it for people who have five legs. There is an Argentinian writer. The, you ever heard of Borges? Of course. Okay. I knew him. I, I, I knew him in Buenos Aires. He was old and blind, and I used to help him to cross the street. He said that chance and destiny are synonymous. Think about it. 